Good morning and welcome to the Time Finance PLC Strategy and Trading Update presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Edwin, my CEO. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, just uh, by way of a brief introduction to myself, uh, Ed Rimmer, and James Roberts, um, I uh, was appointed as CEO of Time Finance just 12 months ago on the 1st of June last year. I've spent around 25 years in the financial services market lending uh, throughout that time to small businesses. Um, and a good chunk of that time was spent, around 22 years, was spent with Bibby Financial Services, um, where I spent five years as UK Chief Executive. Um, over to James. Thanks, Ed. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, James Roberts. I'm the CFO of Time Finance. I've been uh, with Time Finance for about five years now, since 2017 as CFO. Previous to that, uh, like Ed, uh, I've got over 20 years experience in financial services from a range of companies from AIM listed through to early stage startup. But um, yeah, I've been with time for five years now. Thanks, James. Um, so we are going to take you through a presentation which will include a brief summary of how we've done the last 12 months, a recap of what we do, um, how we sit in the market. Uh, and, and a bit more detailed update on our strategy. James will then take you through the numbers and then we'll wrap up with a summary of uh, where we see the business moving forward over the next 12 months. Um, we'll just take the cameras off if that's okay, just allows us to concentrate a little bit more and use some notes. Um, and uh, obviously happy to take any questions at the end of the presentation. So just by way of a brief summary, um, I think it's, uh, fair to say that um, we're very happy with how our strategic plan is taking shape. Um, it has been a, a challenging year, particularly at the start of the year. I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. But overall, we're, we're pleased with the progress that we're making. Um, the own book focus in terms of being a commercial lender to SMEs has really progressed this year. We've had a, around about a 20% increase in our own book lending up to 140 million at the end of May. The deal origination, which is our new business, has also had a, a good increase, around 36% increase from 47 million the prior year up to 64 million the year just gone. Um, and we've certainly simplified our structure and our proposition um, because we've, ent we've exited one of our non-core brokerage businesses, which is the vehicles finance consumer related business called car finance to you um, which now leaves us solely as a business to business lender with three core products um, and focused on being a secured lender to smes that has helped to strengthen our balance sheets um, net tangible assets now stand at over 30 million which is an increase on the, the previous year our arrears very pleasingly have fallen further uh, by around a third over the last 12 months um, and we have strong visibility of future earnings of our 140 million receivables book, around 17 million of that um, is effectively booked income uh, that we will see um, filter into our PL over the next uh, three to five years. Um, so that gives us more confidence over where the financial results will, will move to over the next um, two or three years. So just a, a brief overview of what we do and our key products um, where we sit in the marketplace and then really probably more importantly, the progress we're making on our medium term plan. So who we are, what we do. Well, Time Finance, as many as you've, of you will know, is an alternative finance provider. What does that mean? Um, well, we are not a bank. We're an independent business. We don't take retail deposits. Our, our job is to go out and basically source money uh, as cheaply as we can. That tends to come from um, the, the challenger banks and the mainstream banks. 
Uh, and then we obviously have to run our business in a very personal and flexible way to underpin what we see as a slightly premium service. For that, we charge a little bit more than our banking competitors um, and we make a net interest margin at the end of that. Two key points to make money are to make sure that our overheads are managed in a, a robust way and probably most importantly, to make sure that we minimise the bad debts that we have. If we do those two things well and we source capital at the right rates and lend it out at the right rates, then we end up with a, a, a nice profitable business. And that's effectively what we do. We support UK businesses. We're actually supporting around 10,000 businesses, um, all SMEs, typically turning over up to £5 million. We do lend to some slightly bigger businesses, but our focus is very much on the S of SMEs um, and focusing on um, typically businesses, as I say, that, that, that turn over up to around £5 million. We predominantly lend off our own book. That's been a key focus over the last 12 months. We do still have the flexibility to broke on deals. They're mainly in the asset finance side of our business. And we have a multi-product offering. We're not just a one product provider. We offer asset finance, invoice finance and loan finance, which gives us a competitive edge over a lot of our, our competition. In terms of our core products, well, there's those three products that we now have that I've just mentioned. So uh, just briefly, asset finance, we provide soft and hard asset finance. So that's lending against smaller, lower value assets that don't necessarily have a residual value at the end of the term. Catering equipment um, is a good example of, of soft assets. And we do lend in hard assets, uh, yellow plan, diggers, trucks, trailers, um, assets that are slightly higher in value and that will more likely have a residual value at the end of the term. Um, our introductory channels, we tend to finance, um, we tend to use finance brokers to get the majority of our deals through. We also have agreements in place with, with vendors, so suppliers and manufacturers where we're effectively providing sales aid finance and we get referrals from existing clients as well. Our deal size tends to range at the very smaller end, a thousand pounds for soft asset business up to 250K, but our sweet spot typically five to 10K for soft assets and around 50K for, for hard assets. And typical yields, 8% at the very low end for better quality um, hard asset business and 18 or up to 18% for the smaller, um, we would probably describe as lower quality soft asset business. And the funding comes from wholesale block funders, specialists in the block finance market who tend to be the, the challenger banks and associated names. In terms of invoice finance, um, we provide disclosed and confidential, more commonly known and referred to historically as factoring and invoice discounting. We very much, again, use uh, intermediaries, so finance brokers, insolvency practitioners and professional consultants to refer business to us. Deal size is smaller end, £10,000, all the way up to two and a half million. But again, our sweet spot is somewhere in the middle two to 400K is the deals that we ideally like um, and typically yield 10 at the, the smaller factoring end of the market. Uh, sorry, 10 at, the, at the, the better quality invoice discounting side of the market, up to 20% for the smaller factoring deals. And the funding for the invoice finance business comes from a back-to-back -back facility with uh, NatWest, um, which is one of the highlights of the year in terms of that being renewed at a a slightly higher amount, which I'll, I'll mention in a bit more detail later. Uh, the commercial loan side of the business, it's exactly what it says on the tin. We provide loans to small uh, commercial businesses. They typically range from six months to five years. Again, we use intermediaries to get our business referred to as brokers and professional firms. Deal size is five at the lower end to half a million at the top end. So, um, why we stand out from the crowd and where we're positioned in the marketplace well we, we compete with a, a whole range of, of 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 other players um we do still compete with mac with banks uh, challenger banks alternative pl platforms um more commonly known as fintech businesses other quoted companies and, and smaller private businesses 
the smaller private businesses tend to be very much more flexible, speed of service and personal approach based, whereas the banks, um, as many people will know, don't necessarily have that in their armory nowadays, but they do tend to have a, a good wide range of products. We like to think that we're um, really encompassing all of those things, flexibility, speed of response, personal approach, and the range of products um, that we've got. Um, we're not completely unique, but we are within a smaller band of competitors um, that have those range of products as well as the personal approach, speed of service, and flexibility. So that's very much where we, we sit in the market. We are a tier two player, um, probably operating towards the bottom of tier two, which means that we're chasing business that quite often the banks won't support or don't want support or indeed those businesses don't really want to be part of a of a bank um so we very much see ourselves as having a competitive edge against the bigger um competitive rivals because of our smaller agility flexibility we're very commercial we we, we strive to be easy to deal with and we have a common sense approach to doing business And um, we've, we've won some awards along the way and been nominated for a number of awards. That's very much testament to our team um, of 120 people that we have in the time finance business and their hard work, particularly over the last two years, which has been very challenging for, for everyone during the, the pandemic. So in terms of our medium term strategy and where we are uh, against the aims and objectives that we set out 12 months ago, um, so I guess in, in summary, um, it has been a challenging year, um, but it, I think overall it's been a successful year for us. We started the year off at a difficult time. Um, our year end being the 1st of June was very much um, when the, the whole pinging was going on post the lockdowns. People were finding themselves um, still having to work at home, not being able to come into to offices. And there was a lot of absence both in our business and in terms of clients um, uh, and, uh, and our own funders as well. And um, that impacted the, the, the start of the year, as well as continuing product delays being um, imported into the country for our asset finance business and lots of stored up holiday in the, uh, the first quarter of the year for us during the summer. Pleasingly, things started to get uh, a little bit busier in, in October and the final um, part of the year. And then we really started see, seeing things pick up um, in, in February through to the end of the, uh, the, the financial year in, in May. Um, around 60% of our profitability came in the second half of the year. So we certainly saw things um, better in, in the final half of the year than the first half of the year. In terms of the key aims, um, well, the first one was to become a nationally recognized SME funder. Um, and I think we've, we've definitely achieved a lot of that. We have focused on our three core divisions um, and being a, a secured lender, um, which has made us more easier to understand. We've moved away from um, being a, a mishmash of businesses that were acquired historically um, and being much more easier to understand and, and what we're trying to achieve. We've, we've maximized the multi-products offering. We've got some more developments with that, which I'll, I'll come on to mention in terms of future uh, plans. Um, and we've increased our marketing and PR efforts um, to get greater brand recognition. I think that's always a little bit harder to quantify, um, but a good example of where we've seen tangible success is that our, one of our industry journals, Business Money, which very much supports the invoice finance side of the, of the business, they run an intermediary index each year, and having not really been recognized in that intermediary index, we moved to joint first place this year. And that's really getting feedback from brokers in terms of how companies on board, how they deal with the initial inquiry, um, and how client service is monitored moving forward. So we were delighted to be in joint first place, and I think that's testimony to where we're moving as a, as a business. Um, in terms of our second aim, to more than double the gross lending book um, over our medium term plan, that's to take us up to around a 250 million lending book. Well, we've seen an increase, as, as we said, um, during the course of the, the last 12 months, 19% increase in our, in our lending book. We've taken on some key new hires uh, in our three core divisions. Um, in terms of the invoice finance division, just to give you an example, we've actually doubled the size of the sales team. 
only three of the sales team in that division were actually here 12 months ago. So we've now got a dozen people in that in that division sales team. We've also changed the leadership um, in all those businesses um, over the last uh, couple of years, more latterly, um, with Steve Nichols being appointed in January as head of asset finance and Sharon Bryden being appointed as head of loans um, and Phil Chesham stepped up into the head of invoice finance division um, 18 months or so ago. So we've got some good leadership now, really, really good leadership running those businesses and some um, new and experienced salespeople to spearhead the uh, the drive over the next few years. Quarter four, uh, in terms of our own financial year, as I mentioned, was, was much more successful. Um, around a third of our own book deal origination came in that quarter alone. Um, and we are now move, moving forward with some new products being rolled out. Soft asset side has focused very much on the smaller business to give us a natural spread of, of business. And we've got an automated fast track solution now, which has been rolled out in the last couple of months, which is seeing the business progress at a much quicker rate. Um, VAT loans, which we previously provided three, three or so years ago, the market is coming back for that as the government funded has ebbed away um, and we see an opportunity there. And our asset-based lending um, proposition is due to be launched on the 1st of September after a lot of planning uh, and gaining support from our funders to be able to offer that product. So more news on that um, will come out into the market as we uh, we, we launch the, the product towards the 1st of uh, September. Uh, in terms of the fourth um, aim, um, organically achieved profits in excess of 2019 pre-COVID levels. That's to take the profitability over and above around £6 million PBT um, longer, longer term. And James will come on to talk about the numbers in more, more detail, but I think some of the key progress that we've made in terms of increasing our profitability, we, we've exited, as I mentioned, the second-hand vehicle market um, through car finance to you, which was depressing profits. And quite significantly over the last two years, and James will talk you through the numbers on that. The own book is is very much growing. We have that more confidence around the booked income that we've got within the asset and loans division, and that will drive and underpin future profits over the next couple of years. And despite the challenging um, economic conditions that we hear about every day, we do still believe that that presents opportunities for us to maximise profits over the next few years. Um, so we're, we're confident about being able to move profits forward more tangibly um, than we have done over the last um, two years. And the final one was to significantly strengthen our balance sheet. Well, I'm really pleased with how we've um, progressed this year. Um, our arrears, as I've mentioned, are lower now than they were pre-COVID. We've increased the, the TNAV on the balance sheet uh, over £30 million. And as I mentioned earlier, we had a renewal of our invoice finance funding facility with NatWest. Um, it was enlarged up to 50 million, and that's over a, a three-year deal, and they're very supportive of the business. So that was um, that was great news. At that point, I'll um, very pleasingly, given the delays, um, pause for breath and um, and hand over to James. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah. Um Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, just before we get into the numbers in, in detail, I wanted to uh, very briefly just run through the impact of the non-core brokerages and, uh, and the impact they had on the numbers this year. Um, we think it's in, important to highlight this um, because they've, they've dampened the numbers. It's important. And also we've taken steps, as Ed said, to rectify that going forward. Um, so we think it's a key thing to draw out on, it, on its own. Um, if we just jump back to sort of May 2019, I suppose the last proper year in inverted commas, um, the non-core brokerages were, were quite a key part of the group. They, they made up about six million of revenue and roughly contributed a million pounds of profit for tax to the groups. Um, they were significantly impacted by COVID. And you can see on the on the, the table on the side now, you can see each year they gradually, the revenue reduced to sort of the mid five millions, just over three million. And this year, just finished just under three million. Um, and they went from contributing a million pounds to being uh, uh, making a loss. Unfortunately, the bounce back we hoped over the last 12 months on, on these businesses, and particularly the second-hand vehicle business in, in, in uh, the Northwest, hasn't happened for a variety of reasons. 
Um, and so we took the difficult decision uh, at the end of the financial year to close that, that entity. Um, it's non-core. Um, it was continuing to, to, to lose money and, we, and, it, and nothing seemed to be moving it in the right direction. Well, painful in the short term with a sort of circa £1 million write-off on goodwill, uh, it does leave a lot cleaner, clearer um, business and structure. Uh, and that loss has been removed going forward. So it was a necessary pain we thought to take, but it does put us on a stronger position going forward. Um, but I wanted to give that context uh, in the background to the numbers because it's quite a key key factor on it. We then, what's it not making? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so diving into the numbers in a bit more detail, um, we're going to talk about the quality of the lending book, which is key. We'll talk about the balance sheet uh, and we'll highlight the fact that the own book lending is moving along exactly as we thought, arguably a little bit better. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, jumping forward. Uh, here are the key financials and the fundamentals that underpin the new strategy. You'll see there's a few different headings uh, than have been there in the past for those who've seen a number of these presentations, but as the business shifts into own book lending primarily, there are some uh, other key KPIs that we now look at. Um, as you can see, the own book origination has increased to just over 64 million. That's, that's, that's over 35% increase. Um, and crucially, um, a third of that, as Ed mentioned, was uh, derived in the last quarter, which really sets us up um, strongly going into the new financial year. At the same time, as a result of this increase in own book origination, our gross own book lending book is now just under 140 million at 138.7 million. That's um, just under 20% increase from a year ago. And we'll come on to a bit more details on the own book lending, but that's pretty much back to where it was in the pre-pandemic highs of just over 140 million. So our own book lending uh, size now is, is pretty much back. It's recovered, which is, which is fantastic. Um, at the same time, as a lender, as Ed touched on, the deals that go wrong are key. Uh, it, it's relatively easy. Uh, he says flippantly to lend money, the hard part getting it back. But the next two bullet points are, um, are very key and very pleasing to us. You can see we have no longer any deals in forbearance as a result of the pandemic. It was just under a million pounds a year ago and it was nearer 20 million the year before that. So that's a fantastic result uh, and, and shows the hard work that our colleagues in credit and risk have done. We've also seen the, the, the net deals in arrears are significantly falling, best part of 5 million or 37% reduction on the year before. So the book is a, a much higher quality, if you like, than it was in the past, which is which is great. Um, and we're very pleased with that. And that sets us up well going forward. And all of that sort of is underpinned by the fact the balance sheet is stronger. The consolidated net tangible assets now over 30 million, 30.5 million for the first time. Uh, so there is a strong, solid balance sheet sitting behind this business with arrears uh, significantly reduced and the own book lending origination and book itself growing significantly. In terms of the profit and loss, perhaps uh, slightly more disappointing, but understandable because of the non-core brokerages, uh, as I touched on. Uh, revenue has fallen slightly by just over half a million or 2%. Profit for tax and exceptionals, this is removing one-off adjustments such as the goodwill write-off that I, I touched on earlier of a million pounds such as the restructuring costs associated with uh, closing that non-core business in the Northwest, those type of items, is about £3 million for the year just finished, down from 3.1 the year before. And profit before tax is quite a bit lower at £1.1 million, but that is because it's significantly of that goodwill, one-off goodwill write-off. Um, if we jump forward onto the next slide, if we can. Sorry, sorry, I'm having a few technical don't, don't worry, James, but basically we're on the a robust balance sheet, so I'll turn the slides from here, given your connection. I will change it. So we're on slide, a robust uh, balance sheet, net tangible assets continue to grow. Okay, thank you. Sorry, yes, uh, apologies, no, everybody. No, please the, carry on. Uh, issues, the joys of uh, modern Technology, Wi-Fi. indeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so just exactly. tell me to turn the slide, James, and I'll bring the slides up for the attendees in the room. Okay, Absolutely brilliant. no problem. So, as, as you can see, the, the robust balance sheet, this is key to us as an own book lender. You need a balance sheet, a strong balance sheet sitting behind you. And all the metrics really on our balance sheet over the last 10, 12 months have improved 
We've touched on the net tangible assets. I won't go through it again in any detail, but it is over 30 million. Uh, and the gross lending book as well is almost back to our pre-pandemic levels. You can see there, May 19, 141.7 million. We're now at 137.8. So significantly up from a low of 115.7, um, which is great. And crucially, the arrears and forbearance are now consistently below the pre-pandemic levels. You can see probably from around about September 21, if you look at the purple graph, that bar chart there, from around about September 21, it's been consistently below the levels of January through to March 2019, uh, which was the pre-pandemic levels, um, which is great. And as a, as a percentage of the gross lending book, we're now under 6%, about 5.6% are in arrears compared again to pre-pandemic levels of roughly 8.8%. So about 9% was the his historic trend pre-pandemic. So the book is of a higher quality and in a better position than it was pre-pandemic, um, which, is, which is very pleasing. Mark, if we could skip forward onto the next slide, that would be, that would be great. Perfect. So um, hopefully you can see that, that the next slide, the impact of the size of the loan book. Um, I just want, we've spoken about this before, and apologies to labor the point, but it is quite key on our, our business model. The size of the own book that we lend is absolutely vital for future revenue over one to five years, which in turn will become profits. The bigger the own book you've got sitting there at the start of each financial year, you should get more revenue and profits through the next year, coming years. As you can see on the graph on the right hand side, every lockdown sort of had quite a dramatic effect on our our loan book size, you can see lockdown one hits and we plummet from roughly 100, just over 140 million down to the 115 million level. Lockdown one ends, we start slowly clawing our way back up, but then we're hit by lockdown two and three. And again, the, the loan book size shrinks. But what you can see crucially and touch wood, there'll be no more lockdowns is from the end of lockdown three in the middle of June, to, uh, middle of 2021, consistently and regularly the loan book has grown month on month and continues to do so. And as we touched on right at the beginning of this, Ed, Ed and I both made the point, we are now almost back to the size of book we were pre-COVID. Um, and so long as there's no lockdown, we're cautiously optimistic this will continue uh, to be an upward trend, which sets us up well for the, the future years of our, our medium term plan. Jumping on to, to the final slide from me, um, it's another one we've we, we've touched on in the past if you've if you've regularly attended these calls, but I, I make no apologies for for drawing it out again because it's key. If you look at the key points as an own book lender, it's how big is your book, what are the arrears on your book, and how well spread if things go well are your book. And so diversified lending is an absolute key point for us and a fundamental of how we how we lend as a group. And uh, again, you can see it's very similar to before, marginally better. No one sector makes up more than 9% of, of the book, and the top 10 sectors in terms of quantum are less than 30% of the total book by value. So we are an extremely well spread and diversified lender, meaning if any one sector were to suffer some issue, well, always painful, it's never the end of the world. Uh, and we have a tail of other SIP codes going on into the distance, getting smaller and smaller. So we're very, very well spread, um, which again, adds to the robustness and the resilience of our our balance sheet. Um, that's a whistle stop tour through the numbers. Uh, obviously, we'll be answering questions. I'm sure you've got on those afterwards, but I'll hand back now to Ed to wrap up. Thanks, James. Um, so just on uh, the summary and outlook slide, uh, Mark, and then we'll um, that's that. That's it. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think in, in terms of what we've achieved this year, um, just to recap, we had a, a I would say a difficult start to the financial year. Um, we then started to see an uptick during the autumn, but I think by then we realized that we needed to make some, some changes to the cost base. And um, we mentioned this in the mid-year uh, review that we did back in January. And um, we've not touched on it yet in this presentation, but just to recap, um, we did support all our, our staff and our team through the whole of the, the, the COVID lockdowns. Um, but when it became apparent that the recovery was going to take longer than probably everyone anticipated. We acknowledged that we had to shrink our cost base. So unfortunately, that led to some redundancies at the end of the, the calendar year. Um, we reduced the headcount by around 15% in December and January. Um, but in hindsight, that was the right thing to do, unfortunately. And whilst it was um, uh, unfortunate timing as well, 
um, it was the right thing to do. That gave us a better platform to move forward in terms of cost base. And then pleasingly, as I've said, we saw an uptick in the second half of the year, uh, particularly in the last quarter of the year. So I think in summary, um, our own book lending uh, to the core products of asset loans and invoice finance is certainly gathering pace and it's a, a more easily understood business now to the market. Um, we've exited the, 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 the non-core drag on the business um, in car finance to you, which is a key point so that we can move forward um, without without those non-core businesses in the, in the group. We've made some key hires in all uh, the key divisions, asset loans and invoice finance, and we've expanded the sales team. So again, we're well set up to deliver growth in the future. And pleasingly, we've seen the balance street, uh, balance sheet strengthen, um, and we've arguably now got a cleaner book than we've had in the past because of the focus we've had on, on risk and the improvement in the, the processes, systems, and the people that we've brought into the business. Um, and overall, we think it's been a solid year, despite the, uh, the challenges with COVID, cost of living, and obviously the wider geopolitical challenges as well. Probably most importantly is the outlook. So our strategy, um, we now feel is embedded. It's being progressed. Um, it's well on the way to, to, to delivery and our medium term aims and objectives remain the same. Um, the lending book is expected to continue to grow significantly um, as we move through this year and, and beyond. We do have new products that we're looking to move forward and we've got a new bunch of people that we've brought into the business that we expect to deliver additional revenue streams moving forward. Whilst we've got lots of challenges around and, and anyone that turns on the radio and the news and the television every day hears of another challenge, um, obviously the political challenges are the focus of the day to day, um, but there's many other challenges for small businesses, inflation increases, interest rate increases, fuel price increases, um, and cost of living increases. I think what that does is actually all points to businesses needing to access third party finance and able to su survive, grow, function, um, buy new equipment, um, buy new stock in, and um, generally use for working capital purposes. And, and these environments are very much more favorable to businesses like ours. Um, so whilst there are challenges around, we believe that there's some excellent opportunities, particularly with the changes that we've made to the business over the last 12 months to really move forward now with a, a solid base that we have. Um, that concludes the presentation. So um, very much uh, open to any, any questions and I'll hand over to, to Mark. That's great. Thank you, James, Ed, and apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for the uh, interruption in the uh, presentation this morning. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Um, but just while the company take a few moments to review the questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you the recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the Q&A, will be available via your Investimeet company. Um, James, Ed, I can see that you're continuing to see these um, uh, connection issues. I have um, sent the questions that have come in from investors during the call uh, to you. I just want to make sure that you have access to them. If not, um, if you're happy for me to read them out, really. Uh, Mark, we can see on our screen... Um... We've, the last one we've got came in at eleven thirty-six, but we can, so we've got about six or seven we can read. Yeah, if you want to try different. those, the other ones will then pull through as your connection builds up. We have one from uh, okay. Paul at eleven forty, but yeah, if you go ahead and then okay. uh, I'm here if needed. Okay, great. So um, I'll, I'll take over. Mark, jump in if if we miss anything. So um, first question we had, uh, which I think is is probably one for you, Ed, is does Time Finance have any of the issues which have decimated PCF Group in the last two years? And has a review of these specific areas been performed? Yeah, thanks, James. And, and obviously, a good topical question considering the um, the PR that's been attached to to, to that business. Um, difficult, obviously, because that's um, that's not a business we're involved in. So um, um, limited comments that, that can be made, really. But I think we are a very different business. For a start off, that's a fully regulated bank. Um, we're not a bank and we're not a deposit taker. So there's obviously different regulation at, at, attached to that business. Um, and we also have a wide spread of products. Um, that business is pretty much concentrated in asset finance. We obviously have invoice finance and, and loan finance, as well as some um, spread around the asset finance business in terms of smaller lending at the soft asset market and some 
um, bigger lending in the hard asset. But our, our bigger lending, as we focused in the presentation, average ticket size in the hard asset is, is around 50K. So the point that James made, I think, is very different to our business, which is the spread of, of, of our customers. We don't have major concentrations. We do have a, a great spread of business and industries. So we are a very different business to BCA. Um, that's pretty much all I can say really on that. Thanks, Ed. Uh, second question that came in uh, says, please explain why no updates have been provided to shareholders for an extended time. Uh, Ed, I'll, I'll hand back to you on that one again, if that's okay. Yeah, I think that's a um, cognizance of that, and we have discussed that at the, uh, a recent board meeting. Um, and I think the simple answer is that we were just very focused on making sure that we delivered what we needed to do this year. Um, there was a lot of internal focus. There has been some restructuring. We've been very focused on our teams and bringing new people into the business. And we wanted to make sure that that was then playing out in the in the results. Um, we do recognize that we probably need to be a bit better at improving the communications to the market. And we are focused on a plan for doing that as we move forward through this financial year. Um, so, yeah, I think that's um, that's all I can say on, on that. Thanks, Ed. Uh, third question, looking at it, probably one for me. Uh, please be open about the movements in provisions between the financial periods. So if we take, uh, we, we've, we've spoken a lot today about arrears uh, and everything, and obviously provisions that sit behind those are, are key. The, the policy we had pre-pandemic was we had a, typically had a provisioning level of about one and a half to two percent of the book, the lending book. That was increased during the pandemic uh, to about 5%. We had a provision of about 5% um, during the pandemic. As things have unwound and, 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 and recovered, uh, the policy we're adopting at the moment going forward and where we sit at the moment is to have a provision of about 3.5% of the book going forward. Uh, we feel that reflects the current wider macroeconomic environment, the quality of the book. Um, so it's somewhere, unless there's a big change in, in, in anything, somewhere between the historic level of two and, and the, the, the high of the pandemics of um, of 5%. So it's around about 3.5%, and, and that's the plan is to hold it at about that level going forward. Um, I hope that answers that question. Uh, we've got a question in from John. Thanks, John. During the past year, you've seen a significant change on the share register with a 20% holding changing hands. Are you aware of the reason that Wellesley sold their shares have you met with the new shareholder arena? What are their intentions? Uh, it's quite a long question. This is there scope for them providing more cost effective funding or capital? With the exception of your Ned R Russell, why don't the BOD undertake share purchases considering the attractive value of the shares? There's probably about five questions in there. Ed, are you happy to, to have a stab at them? Oh, I'll certainly have a stab at some of it. Um, so, um, with regard an arena and um, clearly that has been a major change um, we do actually have a meeting with arena scheduled for next week um, and that's our first face-to-face -face meeting we have had um, some conversations uh, on the uh, on the phone and teams calls but they've been quite limited um, what I can say is that um, arena made their shareholding um, purchase with with um, well, no, no dialogue with uh, the, the, the management, myself or the board. Um, that was done and it was um, a surprise to ourselves. So um, whilst it, it, it opens up lots of questions, I'm afraid that I don't have the answers at the moment um, until obviously we found out further more around uh, Arena's intentions. Um, uh, the other points um, around there, um, so... Um, funding or capital? Well, yeah, again, that's linked to the same question, really. I, I, I think there could be opportunities for increased funding, increased capital, but we need to find out more um, on that. Um, and in terms of share purchases, well, we're, we, we have been in a closed period. That's something that we have discussed quite recently. Um, and um, I think that's probably the, the conclusion to that is it's something that we are actively considering and looking at at the moment. Um, so again, yeah, developments on that will will come out over the next few weeks. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the next question came in from Spiros. 
as of today, are the deals in forbearance and the deals in arrears running at the same levels as that period end? Uh, yes, very similar. The, the book is very similar to it was uh, a month and a half ago. No, no major changes up or down. So, yeah, uh, it is pretty much bang in line with where, where we were. Uh, similar question. Sorry. Next one. I should have read, the, read, read one in advance from Paul. Are arrears edging up? Uh, same answer to that. No, it's very similar to where it was at, at the year end. So, um, no, arrears uh, at the moment are, are holding firm. Uh, which again is 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 very pleasing. What I would just say on that, um, I fully expect arrears to edge up, um, and that comes back to the point that I made in the summary slide. We are a business that does well in times of, of boom and bust. Um, we don't do quite as well in mundane uh, periods. So, whilst arrears may start to increase new business opportunities should start to increase um, more so. Um, so the income that we achieve through those opportunities should outweigh the potential slight increase in, in arrears and bad debts that filter through to the bottom line. That's the model uh, of the business for a, a bottom of tier two lender. So um, I'm not phased by that. The, the key point is that we have the business set up to deal with that, um, You know, ride the challenges and take the most of the opportunities. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the next question from Gavin was, is, um, how are you treating the loss of the 300,000 within the vehicles finance business? Uh, is it another exceptional item or is it included in PBTE? We haven't included that as an exceptional item. So our uh, PBTE numbers do include that uh, 0.3 million. So arguably you could say it was a one-off and so the PBTE could be, could be 3.3 rather than three. We haven't put it in there. Uh, because it was part of our normal trading in this year. So the main factors uh, that we've stripped out between PBT and PBTE are the 1 million or so goodwill write-off that we, we mentioned. It's the restructuring and uh, redundancy costs associated with the changes that were made uh, of roughly 0.7 million. Uh, and then there's the, the share-based payments uh, in relation to options, option schemes and such like of a few hundred thousand pounds. Those are the three key uh, exceptional items as we view them. Um, and then finally, uh, oh no, sorry, not finally, there is, there's a few more, but they're from Johnny. Um, you mentioned the poor economic outlook will drive loan growth. How will you ensure that these loans originated are still good quality, uh, Ed? Yeah, and then another good question and topical is how things will play out, I think, over the next year or two. Um, that is very much about the people and the skills that we've got in the team. We're not a business that has gone down the route of complete automation in terms of credit um, scoring. So we do still rely on experience and, and knowledge um, to decide whether we take on business or whether we don't take on business. We, we have a lot of work that goes into educating our brokers into the type of business that we want, the size, the industries, the quality, um, and then we put a, a second round of a, a lot of good work and hard work into that, the credit team to decide and how we structure business. So it's really picking the, the, the business that we want to do um, and making sure that we use our expertise, our knowledge um, and people that we've got in the business that have been through difficult times before to pick the good deals from the bad deals. Um, uh, we will take on some bad deals that's what happens when you're lending money to small businesses um, it's making sure that we learn from the, the mistakes and we minimize those um, uh, it doesn't mean to say that we will always have losses from those businesses a lot of work goes into recovering difficult situations and, and that's what we do so um, the simple answer is it's down to the expertise and, and um, knowledge of our teams Thanks, Ed. Um, and assuming our, our IT is back up to speed, we've got one last question. Um, Mark, shout out for this if there are any others that are coming through slowly. We've got a question from Toby. Uh, what is your target return on TNAV? Um, we don't have a specific target uh, that, that we're aiming for. Pre-COVID, we were in the high teens and our first, I suppose, short-term target is to get back to that over the next 18 months or so. Um, and our our forecasts are indicating we should be on that point. We will um, we will assess after that where where we need to go. So there isn't um, 
a, a set in stone one, but in the high teens is what we're, we're looking to get to uh, over the next 18 months, 24 months or so. I think, Mark, unless I'm missing anything. I think there, 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 are, there are a couple more questions, um, if I may. Um, we've, got a, we've got a question from Paul G. If, if, if you're happy, I'll, I'll read that out for you guys to give a response to. That there might be just a, a delay in that coming through. But uh, Paul G. asks, how can you reduce the discount of market cap to tangible NAV, any dividend capacity? I don't know if that's something that you can give a little bit of clarity on. Uh, any dividend? Uh, so we used to pay a dividend pre-COVID um, and we, with this change of strategy, um, we decided that using our, our, as a lender, we need our own cash and our own capital. And it made sense to us to keep those uh, profits and funds and resources in the business and use them to grow the business. Um, we felt that was a better use of our resources than paying a, what would be, if we're honest, quite a small dividend. Um, and so for the short to medium term, there, there are no plans to reinstate the dividend. Ed, do you have any, anything to add on that? Does that summarize it? Yeah, I, I, I've always held that consistent view. We're, we're a growth stock. Um, the, the more we grow, the more we need to access cash. It makes sense to use our internal resources to help us grow. Um, and that's, um, that's how I see, see, see that playing out. Um, so, yeah, nothing further to, to add on that. That's great. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions. The one's quite long. What, what I propose to do, if it's OK uh, with you both, is is I'll make these questions available to you after today's meeting and then you can give a written response and I'll publish those with the uh, with those that uh, obviously we will transcribe that you've answered during today's call and then send those to everybody that's on today's call, um, if that's OK with you. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan, Mark. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you very much indeed. Well, look, um, again, once again, to everybody on the call, apologies for the uh, the, uh, the the connection issues that we've uh, that we've seen this this morning, but hopefully we've managed to get across um, the basis of today's presentation. Um, Ed, James, I know that investor feedback is important to you both, and I'll shortly redirect investors to give you their thoughts and expectations following your presentation and the questions that were submitted uh, today. But before doing so, I wondered if I may, Ed, just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with and as I said to John, Philip and Gavin those three remaining questions I'll make those available to the company after today's call so thank you. Yeah, thanks Mark um, and well thank you everyone for joining um, I appreciate time is uh, critical for a lot of people so um, it is appreciated having the opportunity to update you on our, our plans both for the last 12 months and, and future looking and, and just to reiterate I'm terribly sorry about the connectivity issues um, I can promise you it, it has more of an impact on us uh, than it probably does with um, with you guys listening in. Um, but hopefully we've got the, the main points across. Um, I'm excited about the future. I know we have challenges, but I think that's good. I think we're in a much better position than we were um, 12, 18 months ago. We've taken a bit of pain in terms of reducing our, our staff. That wasn't pleasant. We've restructured the business in terms of the non-core uh, entities. We're very much now clear and focused on what we're trying to achieve by being a business-to-business -business lender to small businesses with three core products um, and also linking those products together through offering more than one uh, product to, to, to more businesses. And I think there's lots of more opportunity in the market that we can benefit from. So um, I think it'll be an exciting few years for Time Finance and I, I look forward to taking the business forward from uh, from here. That's great. Ed, James, thank you once again for updating investors this morning. Colour, please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can really better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by James and Ed. On behalf of the management team of Time Finance PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending this morning's presentation. Once again, our apologies for the connection issues and may I wish you all a very pleasant morning. Thank you.